right, so we'll begin. Thank you very much for agreeing to do this, Casey. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks okay. for coming. <laughs> um, would you please state for the camera uh, your name, your date of birth, and the location that we're at right now? Casey Silen Mohammed, October 10th, 1962. We're at Southern Oregon University in Central Hall. Okay. Um, so the first the first section is kind of a short answer. It's, it's meant to get uh, a sense of your digital practices now. Um, and uh, so you can just kind of, we'll just kind of go through this and then we'll talk more about the composition. Mm -hmm. um, so what genres do you work in? Uh, poetry. Okay. <laughs> and that's your primary genre. Yeah. Um, what kinds of devices do you own or have access to for writing? Uh, this laptop, uh, MacBook. Okay. That's main, That's about it, you know, other than whatever scratch pad I might know an idea on. Um, so do you, so you, so you used only that one? Do you write on a phone? Do you write on any other things? Usually not. I mean, the laptop is the main instrument. The, the laptop is the main instrument. Um, and you have an Apple. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and also, I mean, do you then, when you said you use some note, you note paper sometimes. I mean, I mean, if I'm somewhere and all I have is a piece of scratch paper because I'm in a meeting and I get an idea and uh -huh. I don't want to lose it. But that's, I don't even really do that that often. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty primarily on that computer. That, it's, that's mostly it. Okay. Do you have any? I mean, do you, for your writing, and this is where we get to the. Uh, do you do you ever have to take like pre-writing or notes for it? I mean, because of the kind of writing I do, that usually doesn't come into play. Yeah, which I think will become clear when we talk about the actual composition. Okay. Uh, and then, what format do you save your digital files? Uh, Word. Word doc. Um, do you save individual works as you go along, or do you simply save over what you've written? Do you have like? Do you save like drafts? Oh no, no. That's I don't. I probably should, but I almost never save drafts. Okay. Yeah, so I just open up a doc and write over it until I think it's finished. Okay. Um, and what are your naming conventions for your files? Uh, usually the name of the poem followed by the file name. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but and so because you don't use drafts, you're just like it's just the one. Yeah, I don't rename it once I've drafted it or anything. Yeah, it's just, okay. it just stays the same. Thing. Uh, do you ever do you print out your writing to revise it? No, not typically. Okay. No. The uh -huh. one except I mean I might do that um, on occasion with a with an essay or something with an essay because yeah. I need to be able to you know, it's easier on the eyes. But the poems are usually shorter and again because of the specific nature of the composition. Sure. You know, in some cases you will see it's like the, they can't really revise it very well at all if it's not on the computer. Yeah. Um, and so, if you don't use, do you ever save any paper copies of interim drafts? Mm, usually not. Okay. I can't. I mean, I think the only exception to that is maybe I have some paper copies somewhere of something I wrote in college and hope no one ever sees. Because you know? <laughs> that's the way they were written. I don't I never bother to transcribe them yeah. digitally. Um, so, do you uh, do you back up your work? Yeah, I, when I remember. Okay. <laughs> and how often do you do that? Oh God, this is streaming. I don't know. Uh, I probably need to do it right now. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I I really it's very erratic. Okay. Um, and so do you do you use you don't use a, like a cloud based? Do you have like a Dropbox or anything? I mean, is that uh, you know I've got um, a server here on campus that's a backup server that I save okay. things to, which is very simple. All I need to do is drag stuff right now, and I could do it. And stop worrying about it. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I've so, also got an external hard drive at home. You have an external, and that's if you're going to archive it, if you're going to back it up, that's where you put the put the work. Okay. Um, and say, like, if, do you have like a separate thing for once, like once a poem is finished, do you move it to a different folder, or are there any? Yeah, I, I, I've gotten kind of lax on, and I need to uh, go in and and uh, you know update it. But uh, but you, typically what it'll be is I'll have a folder, uh, a, a main poetry folder. Um, and within that, if there are specific categories for certain projects, I'll divide them into that, like a book project yeah. or, or whatever. Um, and if something's published, typically I'll put a copy of it in the published folder. And then the other will be like an ongoing or in process folder. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you keep print copies of final drafts? Do you print them out? Not usually. Um, and how about the media you've been published in? Do you keep the journals? In I do. Certain yeah, I space? have a shelf full of journals and books. Okay. And uh, so, do you have any standard practices for archiving, or di digitally, or, or or physically? Would you say? Um, maybe 
explain what you mean a little more. I guess, I mean, do you have, like, like when you put it on, a, like, do you have, like, a certain kind of way you go and you put it on an external hard drive or you put all the book, all your papers or books in a certain shelf and that's kind of, like, your archive? Yeah, oh, right, yes. The, like, yeah, like I say, I do have a shelf in my living yeah. room. It's, like, most of the journals and books and anthologies that I've been published in. Yeah. Um, and as far as I said, for the digital files, the, yeah, there's usually a published folder. Okay. Right, which is way behind being updated, but... Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so have you ever received or sought out information about digital archiving or any sort of practices in that way? Not really, no. Okay. No. Um, would you be interested in receiving information? I mean, possibly, yeah. Um, okay, that was the kind of basics. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this, this gets more to the, to the kind of like your, your trajectory as a writer. And um, so it start out kind of getting a, a larger uh, arc of it. So how long have you been writing, and this is the, the word in... in uh, or in quotations here, professionally? Uh, I'd say since roughly 98 or 99. 98 or 99. And could you kind of give us a, a sense of like the arc of your career mm -hmm. um, over that time period? Sure. I mean, I'd say that was when I was just finishing grad school okay. um, and procrastinating <laughs> on finishing my dissertation. Uh -huh. So I kind of went back to my longtime interest in, in contemporary poetry. And I think I had tried to send a few things out to get them published over the years a few times without any success and, yeah. or sense of direction about it. Uh, and then during all this time-wasting period, um, you know, I became aware of electronic you know, journals that were publishing authors I liked. And but before that, I hadn't, hadn't known even how to submit work you yeah. know, to the same journals that would publish the kind of writers I liked because... You know, I had tried, so for example, five, ten years before uh, to submit to magazines that I knew published language poetry, things yeah. like that, and typically I would either get no response or maybe a slip saying, sorry, this journal is no longer in circulation, <laughs> because the only way I heard about them in the first place was from library copies, or right. uh, so I had no contact with any of the people involved, and yeah. so the internet changed that. And then, yeah. You know, published in a few online journals, and made contacts with poets that way, and from then it was pretty rapid. That uh, from uh, an initial chapbook that was published uh, by Kenning Editions, run by Patrick Durgan in 2001, called Hovercraft. Uh, and then my first book in 2003 was Deerhead Nation, from Tougher Disguises Press, mm -hmm. edited by James Metz. Uh, and then another book the next year, Mike McGee's Combo Books, A Thousand Devils. A couple books at the end of the decade from Edge, from Rod Smith and Roof, James Sherry, yeah. um, and lots of journals and anthology stuff in, in the middle there. Yeah, um, and a few other chapbooks I have neglected to mention. Things like. And then, and now your your project you're working on is the sonograms. Is that correct? That's my chief project. Yeah. Okay. But you have other ones going. That's well. That's the one that I consciously think of as a project that I'm in the middle of. Occasionally, I'll write something just on a whim or. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, that's the main project. Um, so, uh, so we're going to talk about it in a, in a, in a like a couple different steps of the writing process, and then we're going to go through kind of how it was the, in the early stages of your writing, and then how it's changed. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I have the I have my sort of my the kind of way of, of thinking about it is like there's the compositional stage, which is where you're kind of you're creating it. Then you have the revision stage. And then you have the kind of organizational archival stage, which is where you're putting it into books and getting it published. Mm -hmm. And so those are the three stages to talk about, but then, and how those have changed over the course. So it's sort of like sure. three by three. Um, so when you first started writing, and this is even before you started writing professionally, like maybe before when you were like trying to find those language, language journal or language poetry journals, uh, I mean, how, what was your composition? How were you writing? Like, what were you doing? It's really hard to <laughs> reconstruct something that long ago. Yeah. Um, I don't think I had much of a method. Okay. I, I think I was really just kind of feeling around in the dark. Yeah. Um, so I took a couple of you know I took a, a couple of creative writing classes in junior college. I took one as an undergrad that didn't really work for me. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I passed. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> I did, didn't do anything for me. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, and then I would just occasionally feel inspired to write something. I mean, it was very uh, shapeless. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, how did you come to find the writing that you liked? I mean, to find the language poetry, to find the the journals that you, and then you were sending out. Yeah. Well, I don't remember what led me to it, but I remember just you know surfing the web. Uh, yeah. I think one of the journal, the, one of the very first journals that caught my attention was Combo, uh, edited by Mike McGee. Mm -hmm. 
and he published Clark Coolidge and other language poets and younger poets I hadn't heard of, and, um, and there was a, and it was, at least some of it was online. I think, if I remember correctly, it was like limited digital yeah. uh, sampling. Um, and I just emailed him uh, within said, hey, how does one go about you know, submitting work or something like that? Yeah. And he liked the work, and I published him there several times. The same thing with um, Kenning, which was also a journal, Patrick Durgan's journal. Uh, I think my first publication, actually, was in 14 Hills okay. uh, from San Francisco Seriously, State. Yeah. And uh, I went to a group reading for the contributors to that issue and met a lot of Bay Area poets th at that. So I established a connection with the. I forget what the original question was. No. <laughs> oh, I, I, it's fine. I mean, this—that's actually kind of where I'm pushing you. Um, and then, so I guess, and, and so your 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 writing styles in the beginning, your, the ways of composition, you are kind of formless and oh, you're yeah. starting to come. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. How did they start to progress then? I mean, what were the what's the sort of next step? And sure, that's actually pretty easy to answer because it's kind of like a. At least so far, it's been sort of a really distinct three-stage process. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, well, I can just actually answer this uh, according to the terms of the question. Yeah. So that earliest work, and this would be everything up through you know, the period I'm talking about, yeah. uh, was just basically, I don't know how, quite how to describe it, organic or freehand or you know, just making stuff up and writing it down. Mm -hmm. uh, words would come into my head. <laughs> okay. I would put them on the page. Yeah. Um, so typically I would just, you know, type, and it would be like, I don't know, like uh, trying to compose a musical piece or something, like, what what should go after this? How can I uh, can I complete this rhythm or yeah. uh, a set of images or something like that? Um, and then that began to change with, you know, again, I'd say 2000, 2001, when I met Gary Sullivan mm -hmm. and other members of the Flarf group. Um, and that itself had, that second stage had kind of like two stages. Um, at first, I became acquainted with Gary's writing on an email list that we were both on. Right. I mean, just for a joke, he wrote like some New Year's poem or something like that, um, that he called a flarf poem. Flarf was the invented name for the method. It was just basically writing the stupidest, most shapeless thing you could think of. Yeah. Uh, so it was just full of nonsense and obscenities and phatic noises and... Uh, with no real shape or form other than just, you know, base, roughly being broken into lines. Mm -hmm. um, and he and, and I and a few other people started doing this just for fun on our own. We created our own e email list okay. just so we could do And uh, I, I'm sure the full origin story's out there. Like, yeah, yeah. About... But it's, it's just for my clarification, it started on a different email list and then it moved to its own. That's right, and and I guess really it started the the at least if I'm correct about this, I think this is what Gary um, related to me, that he sent uh, a poem into one of those online vanity press things, poetry.com, right. yeah, uh, and the short short version trying to get rejected, <laughs> right, and <laughs> yeah. so he wrote just the stupidest thing he could think of, and it was except I mean quote. It was accepted for consideration for the anthology, which you didn't pay for. Right. You know, if you actually are dumb enough to go through with that. And, yeah. Um, so that so that was the the origin of that, and that, then he just started writing more of them on the email list, uh, even after he realized he couldn't get rejected, right? Because it yeah. was fun. Yeah. And so the group of us, <coughs> pardon me, um, you know, were on this list, and then eventually I think it was Drew Gardner who uh, introduced a method. I'm in the middle of all this shapeless writing of using Google search results. Okay. Um, just going to a Google, the Google page, doing usually like a combination search for like two or three terms that you don't expect to see on the same page together. Right. And then just using that initial search result page as a base from which to collage excerpts, not following the links. Just 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 the language that shows up in the Google kind of like the cache aids or the, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my typical process. That is, so this is the second stage of. Got okay. that big second stage where for ten years I basically just wrote Google collages. Okay. And the typical process for that was I would you know copy however many pages of the search result page you know because you click next page next page or just have a hundred results show up on a page or whatever. Yeah. And then paste that into Word and start chiseling it down. Okay. And rearranging it and shuffling the contents and occasionally cheating a little by putting a connector word in or something. Like yeah. And or the. Um, or maybe altering a word that was, you know, just in a slightly different grammatical form or something. Yeah. Um, 
but that gets back to what we were saying about you know not doing print revisions because really everything's done with the kind of like refrigerator magnets that I'm just shuffling around. Yeah, um, yeah. And you know, and I guess printing out a page, I could look at that and think, oh well, if I brought some of this down here, see it all. But I never did that. So yeah. no, <laughs> right, right. No, I mean it makes it you're just kind of it's computer generated. Yeah, and part material. of the fun of it was using the computer as a kind of uh, kind of canvas. Yeah, yeah. And that was. It's kind of just there's something pleasing about pulling the components around and almost physically moving them around that that digital space. And when you're when you're copying the page, do you just say like Control All, grab it, drop it in? Do you get like images and whatnot with that, or do you do you just like drag the thing up and just get the text and paste it in? Yeah, again, typically on a Mac, I would just select the whole page. Yeah. Copy, paste. I mean, and then there weren't any images because it was just the result page. Just the result page, right. okay. But what you would get was a lot of the kind of like uh, red or blue text or purple text. Yeah. With the URLs and headers and things like that. And typically, I would just, you know, first stage of going through the the manuscript would be to remove all that kind of junk text. Mm. I mean, it was all junk, but... Right. Uh, no, 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 but that's... Uh, but yeah, that was just numbers and code. Okay. Um, and so all I had left was, you know, recognizable words and maybe numbers and, um, and in getting rid of that of that junk text um, were you reading it at the same time or were you starting to kind of get a sense of what you had gotten or was it just like kind of a rote let's get rid of this and then I'll uh, look at it I mean I think based on my memory usually it would just be a, it would be a rote thing of just okay first let's get rid of everything I know is not actual you know in most cases, not usable text. I mean, there might be some little strings of code where I think, oh, that's kind of cool just by itself, I'll leave that in. Yeah, okay. But it was mostly an automatic uh, process of just let me reduce it to just letters and, you know, black text. Yeah. As opposed to colored link text. Sure. And then I'd have... Then from that stage, it'd be, I don't know how interesting this could possibly be to anybody, but... <laughs> well, I'm, I'm interested, so... <laughs> what would be left after that would be a lot of things like ellipses. Yeah. Or uh, dashes, or, you know, because there'll be like partial phrases, and then an ellipsis, then the beginning of another phrase, and that would be how the search results would be uh, arranged on the page. Yeah. So then I might just say, okay, I'm going to get rid of all or most of the ellipses, or dashes, or, and I would also, I think, uh, I know, I, I would also go through and just for the sake of composition, uh, change case, select everything and change case to lowercase. Okay. Just to get rid of all the, blocks of long blocks of caps that were kind of unwieldy or yeah uh, and then as I was later in the process of composition I might change some letters back to caps but typically for whatever reason um, the default format for the poem would be no caps unless they were required by you know convention mm -hmm. like I mean by which I mean like proper names yeah uh, things like that no, I wouldn't capitalize the beginning of a line or anything like that right um, so I'd just start, basically, once I'm ready to actually start composing the poem, I'd have however many pages full of lowercase language. Yeah. In black and white. And so for the dashes and, and ellipses and whatnot, would you just do a find all and delete them? Yeah, yeah, that would be the quick way. I learned that pretty quickly. That would just, like, find this, replace with nothing, yeah. until I had just words, okay. for the most part. Maybe some numerals. Yeah. Um, and so, and then you would get to the, and and so, I mean... That's almost your kind of pre-writing stage in some ways, mm -hmm. and then you're to the point where you're comp composing the poem or, or whatever word you want to use. I mean, I mean, sure. what words do you use? I guess. Yeah, and then after that, I mean, I, once I've just because of the nature of the the way it was copied onto the page, what I'd usually end up with would be something like uh, tercets mm -hmm. or something that looked on the page already kind of like tercets, which is. Why a lot of the poems, not all of them, but a lot of them yeah. would end up being intersets. Yeah. And I would just keep that, and sometimes two lines, sometimes three lines, or sometimes longer, sometimes more, longer mm -hmm. stanzas. But sometimes just that accidental form would give me a kind of a starting point. And I think, okay, I've got groups of three lines, but I want to move this line from this one up here to this other one and balance out the other one with the other line or phrase. So... Like I said, it would be like refrigerator magnets, although sometimes with full phrases instead of just individual words. Yeah. And in the mid middle of that process, I would eventually get rid of most of the language. You know, so some of the language I just could not figure out anything interesting to do with, or it just wouldn't be interesting. Yeah. So the finished poems might be anywhere from, you know, a third of a page to a couple pages long. 
but I'd be starting sometimes with like ten pages or. And you just go and delete, 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 mm -hmm. rearrange, and, shuffle. And so, what was what was the what were the phrases or, or words or or groupings that would would catch your eye or catch your or ear? I mean, in what in which was it catching? I guess too. I'd say earlier in the process, it had more to do with the original search for terms I used. Mm. So, for example, my first book, Deerhead Nation, yeah, uh, involved a bunch of searches that usually included, among other terms, the term deerhead. Yeah, and. Uh, so for that, I was obviously motivated to keep Deerhead a lot of the time, like yeah. keep that theme going. Um, or sometimes I would just think of a phrase I think was funny or bizarre, and I'd want that to be the title, and I'd want to keep a few instances of those words in the poem. I'd say as I got uh, several years further along in the process, I got to the point where I didn't really care if the original search term, search term showed up at all. Yeah, I just wanted to create a kind of a lyric construct. Yeah. But that was lim limited for its sources to the that bank of terms. What do you think um, got you to that sort of preference? Was it no idea? No uh, idea. I think just getting bored uh, with the regularity of the earlier process, yeah. which I think worked really well for me in the yeah you know, some of the original first projects, right? Because they were kind of more thematically motivated. The uh, you know the deer head thing was supposed to be kind of a metaphor for yeah you know, imperialism or something. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> um, but. But as it went on, I just really got, became more concerned with just wanting a verbal shape or sculpture yeah. that, that I found interesting. So, And do you find then that those later poems are more like readable or, I mean, like... <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's a good, I'm, I'm laughing, but, but I mean, it's, you know, I, I think one person's definition of readable is very different from another's. Yeah. Because, I, in all honesty, I think some people would look at, whether it's early in the stage or later in the stage, look at it and think, this isn't poetry. Right. You know, this is just um, spam or something. This is just garbage from the internet. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, but I think, uh, I don't even think that the divide is along experimental or traditional necessarily, because, frankly, a lot of the biggest critics of Flarf were experimental poets. Right. So I think it really just had to do with it, whether a person has that kind of mind that likes arrangement in that sense, rather than, um, you know, some, so I, let me rephrase that. I think it depends on whether someone's drawn to a verbal arrangement over and above verbal theme. Okay. And, I mean, that's what drew me originally to poets like Clark Coolidge or other language poets or, you know, so it didn't matter what it said. Yeah. In the traditional sense. I was interested, like, wow, how can you put those words in that place? Right. And so I don't really know what's readable, you know, to to, to, to the, quote, average person. Yeah, Because I don't yeah. think there is an average person. <laughs> I guess in terms, of your, uh, in terms of your own reading or in terms of your own sort of composition, I mean, like, when you're making those things, I mean, did you find those later poems to be more pleasurable to make? I mean... Uh, was was there like a I don't know was there I mean you said there more like a there was more of a lyric bent to them yeah I don't know if other people would see it as lyric necessarily but yeah I mean I think so I think that the it, it, inevitably it became almost at least from my perspective more traditional okay I mean again I don't think other people would look at yeah other people would look at think say you call this traditional but but I felt yeah. like I was kind of going back to the kinds of things that pleased me about older forms of poetry mm -hmm. so. So even if the poems themselves have like ridiculous vocabulary and images and you know, uh, you know junk food and uh, porn site terminology or whatever else comes off the internet, yeah, I'd be looking for a rhythm. I'd be looking. You know, I'm very influenced by somebody like Clark Coolidge on that level, which right. is kind of a the jazz influenced uh, mode of composition. And so I guess, I mean, how are you constructing your lines then? I mean, if you're looking for that sort of rhythm. I mean, I guess the lines are really just determined by the, by the, by the shape of the phrases. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, the rhythm comes outward from the words. It's not, it's not like a pentameter rhythm or something that's right. determined by a set length. Yeah. No, it's a, uh, not in that project, not in those books. And then where, where are you getting, I mean, where are you grabbing... When you when you grabbed a phrase or a few phrases, were, were those almost automatically lines, or would you break those into different lines? Oh, it would really depend. But usually, I do a lot of breaking. I mean, okay. there's a sense in which the whole process is kind of unnecessary. I mean, because ultimately, okay. what I was doing was just manipulating the the results so much that 
there, I mean, I would think all the time, I really don't need to go to the internet for this, except at the level of just, I think, vocabulary. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And maybe beyond that, just little syntactical clusters. Right. Like, oh, wow, look at these four words in a row. Right. I, I would never have come up with these four words in a row on my own, just trying to think of something. So what I was looking for is really just a palette full of colors mm -hmm. that I could use, that, that I, colors I couldn't think of by myself. Because okay. no human being, I mean, would think of putting those things in a poem because they're just, you know, they're not that. They're something else at that stage. So in, in terms of, like, your revision strategies for these poems, I mean, in the early stages, you you had a more, I mean, this I'm just sort of recapping a little bit, you had a more intent towards uh, representing the, the search in some very fundamental way, and then later it started to become, you, you wanted to kind of represent an accumulation, uh, an arrangement, um, more, yeah, more lyrically, or more, more, more in, a, in a way that the kind of traditional in your in your traditions of, of poetry. I, I mean, think the one constant was the importance of the idea that it was generated by the search, mm -hmm. right? And I think that was, I mean, I think that is a factor for the reader. I think, you know, I don't see any need to mask the the method. I think sure. um, one of the pleasures for me of reading other work like that by other people is knowing, oh, they did this by using a particular procedure. Right. You know, and I'm still most interested in how how the finished work affects me. But the knowledge that it was created in a certain way is something I can't separate and I don't want to separate. Yeah. So I you know, I would frame the work all the way through as like this was you know, if I were to mention it, which I had occasion to do, um, you know, the beginning of the book or yeah. whatever. No, it... Yeah. This was created by using Google search methods and Yeah. So I think it helps if people go into it with that knowledge. Sure. Um, but, like you're saying, I didn't necessarily want the search to retain some, like, imprint of the all the original conditions of the search. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the first book, that, to some extent, yeah. For example, in Deerhead Nation, I not only kept a lot more uh, longer clusters of, you know, original syntactic clusters, but I would keep a bunch of ellipses and create yeah. uh, visual... Uh, groupings with them, uh, all these kind of graphic reminders of what the process was. And I just felt less inclined to do that as I went because it didn't seem necessary for the different kinds of poems I was going into. Right, right. Um, what about the prose poems in in, the, in these in mm -hmm. these uh, in, in, in this tradition? I mean, like, how did those come about? Oh yeah, I mean, same thing. Okay. Um, but there, I mean, there the original search terms did remain did remain much more important. Yeah. Because, I mean, you'd have a phrase like, and then she said, you know, or yeah. something very fixed. And obviously, in order to keep the shape of the, you know, throughout the bum, I'm going to have to keep coming back to that tag. Right. So, uh, and, and there, there the goal was usually to make it seem seamless, like it's the one subject, you know, saying something over and over again. Uh, so, yeah, that would be an exception mm -hmm. uh, whenever I do it. Although, I think I also did some prose ones where I didn't stick that much to whatever original grammatical... Framing, right? Going, I don't remember offhand how or which ones, but yeah. Uh, um, so I, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. Way. And, and then so, so we're at that. I mean, uh, well, I mean, I guess this, this is one of the questions that I ask a lot: is is were you kind of were these revisions driven by sound? I mean, were you reading them out loud to get a better kind of rhythm, or or did you have like meanings or themes that you wanted to elicit? I mean, especially it seems. A, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think sound was probably usually the at least tied for the primary okay. elevator there. Yeah, and what would what would determine a line break then in terms of sound? That's a difficult question, even for like traditional <laughs> modes of writing, right? Yeah, it's that's like, an impossible I mean, question. This is one of the things that drives me crazy in workshop when I'm teaching. Is like, on the one hand, wanting people to think about line breaks and what motivates them and what they yeah. do. On the other hand, getting so tired of getting bogged down in completely arbitrary uh, theories of like the line break, because yeah. it's, in some ways it's the like a very important thing, in some ways it's just totally random. I mean, right. not in every poem, obviously, and of course, especially obviously, if you're working in a fixed form, it's yeah. taken care of. But right. for free verse or procedural or other kinds of things where the line breaks are kind of a post facto consideration, yeah. I mean, really, I, it's just going on my nerve, you know, just what strikes me at the moment is seeming like a good way to keep the rhythm going or to create a halt in the rhythm or yeah. do a little both, depending on where I am in the poem. Sure. Yeah. Um, did you 
Yeah. So for the, for the for these uh, for the and and what okay what's what would be the phrase that you would use? Like, I mean, you said it's collage. So you say Google collage. I mean, I've, I've seen Google sculpt. I've yeah, seen sort of Google found sculpting poetry. Is the term I kind of tried to put out there for it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then, and so that's the one that you you sort of prefer is saying it's like a Google sculpting. Yeah, being, sculpting Google collage works too. Collage yeah. works. Okay. Um, and then, did you save? Like, do you know what the terms are for each poem? And is there somewhere where that is recorded? No, no. I sometimes think about that. Why didn't I keep a record of like what, it, how exactly this came about? But yeah, I'm too, yeah, I'm too kind of absent-minded and lazy for that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, probably have to like recreate it someday by using like simulators. Oh, you can't because I mean the internet has completely changed, right? Yeah, it's gone no, forever. I know. <laughs> I know. It's so fascinating. Um, and then, so I guess, okay, so those are, that's, so we've moved from the first stage mm -hmm. to the second stage, and then the two stages of that, the latter stage of that having run up for about ten years, you said? Something like that, yeah. So, like, I'm writing just free form, or however you want to describe it, uh, from, like, 98 to 2000, so that's a very short phase. Okay. Even though the second book, A Thousand Devils, was kind of stuff left over from that stage. So oh, okay. Even though that came out in 2004, most of it had been written quite earlier. a bit earlier. And the hovercraft is also that that's sort of stage? That, yeah, that's that initial stage. Okay. And then the second stage starts with Deerhead Nation. Mm -hmm. Through Breathalyzer and the front. And the front, okay. Um, and then, and now the project, and then so this third section then is, is the sonograms? Yeah. And so how did that project come about? And I should just, I mean, I think this goes without saying, I'm calling these stages just as a convenient way of separating well, full time. Well, it helps, it helps yeah. my kind of, yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to, I don't think of it necessarily like, oh, this is the, you know, initiatory <laughs> stage and I develop into this. It's just what I happen to start doing or stop doing. No, it, yeah. yeah, it's, a, it's not um, a progression, it's more just... Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, so the sonograms, I'd say, I forget what year, I think maybe it's been embarrassingly a long time now because I've been working very slowly on it. I've, yeah. I've been a very lazy poet. Um, it's the best poet, and so, I mean, if, it would have been finished a long time ago if I'd kept any schedule. Okay. But uh, I'm a little over halfway through, and I think I started, I don't know, 2008 or something like that. Uh-huh. Um, and it started, it was like National Poetry Month, and I was looking for an idea for, like, just something, some quick and easy gimmick to allow me to write a poem a day. Mm. I thought, oh, I can do something with Shakespeare's sonnets. You know, so I go to the internet, I find a sonnet, I copy it, I post it, in, I paste it into a word. Document. Okay, what can I do in the next five or ten minutes using this as my source? You know, to say, here, I wrote a poem for, for the silly tradition. Yeah. Um, and I started just kind of shuffling it and playing with it and with my cursor and thinking. And I had been recently impressed by a book by Gregory Betts. Okay. Um, which I'm now uh, embarrassingly forgetting the title of. Um, anyway, it's a. It's, it's a, it's a it's a book in which he takes a paragraph from a speech, uh, and rearranges it, rearranges it multiple times throughout the book, just by letter. So it's anagrams of the same paragraph. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, a Christian book gave me a copy of this, uh -huh. as well as I think Gregory Betts was with him at the time, and said, "Hey, here's you'll like this book," and I did. I thought, "Oh, I want to play around with that idea." So I suddenly remembered, "Oh, anagrams." Well, okay. This will probably take too long, but I'll just uh, start shuffling it around, like figuring out ways to break it up. And then I came up with the idea of taking each of the lines mm -hmm. and feeding them into an anagram generator. Um, because that's all that would fit at a time, would be one line. Okay. So I did that, and, I, and every time I feed it in, the anagram generator would give me a, a choice of a bunch of word lists yeah. that you could make by rearranging that particular line. I just picked the one I liked the best. And until I had this uh, poem that was 14 lines of silly words. Yeah. Right? So I thought, okay, there, that's a poem. And that's uh, not that interesting, right? And it yeah. was kind of cool. And in retrospect, that's another thing I wish I had done, which is save all these initial first stage word lists yeah. that I used to create the poems. Right. I haven't. Um, <laughs> the librarian to me is sort of <laughs> right. cringing right now. Well, <laughs> no, it's. Yeah, because they were kind of neat poems about them, like yeah. cheap, cheap fake poems on their own. Right. You know, they were just. just line-by-line line anagrams of the original sonnet, but without much syntax or anything. They're just, they're just words in a row. Right. Um, so I sat there and thought, oh, I'm already like 10 minutes into it, this 10 or 15 minutes into it. But it'd be more interesting if I actually just moved the letters throughout the entire poem, like Gregory Betts did. Mm -hmm. um, and 
So I did that, and then like four or five hours later, I <laughs> realized I'd been working on this poem for like a big chunk of the day. Yeah. Uh, and then I got really hooked on it and started doing a bunch of them. And I don't think I kept to the, uh, the whatever it's called, National Poetry Writing Month schedule. Right. Uh, but, I, but I did a few of these, and I had a, um, you know, soon, like, I stuck them. Now I'm up to like, I don't know, 90 something of them. And I, it's embarrassing, like I said, since 2008, I should have a lot more. Uh, but um, and there are 154 total. Okay. So yeah, so I would just each poem is just you know an anagram. Yeah. And then I always say there's a cheat that I'll use all the um, the letters to create a new poem in iambic pentameter with the original rhyme scheme. Mm -hmm. you know, a B A B etc. Three quatrains and a, and a couplet. Um, but then I'll have letters left over. Right. Never. Uh, uh, almost never is a problem that I don't have enough letters. Usually it's just I don't have, I can't use them all in the poem. So, so I have to use those extra letters and make up a title, and that usually is pretty stupid. Yeah, I mean, the whole poem's stupid, but the, <laughs> but the but the title isn't in pentameter or anything. It's just whatever I can do with the leftover letters. Those death. <laughs> <Like that. laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No. So, when did you? So you had. So you started off with the, the kind of. Um, uh, the stuff from the anagram generator, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm assuming that's not an iambic pentameter. I mean, like, right. no, so it's just words. When did that? So when w was that the initial move? That first day you went to I, you're like, oh, I need to make this to mi to match up with the Elizabethan sonnet format. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty much it. I think the very first one is the one that's on this little trading card. Oh, I have that trading card. Uh, <laughs> they have here somewhere. I think. Well, hiding, but yeah. Uh, it's, frankly, I think now I look back at it, it's definitely the worst of all of them. Because, I mean, it's got sort of a consistent syntax and grammar, but it's just complete nonsense. Um, I don't know why I can't find it, but... Uh, but it, it fit. It was, you know, technically iambic pentameter. Yeah. And, uh, it technically rhymed. It right. Half rhymed. And then I got much more stringent about it from then on. I was like, oh, I'm going to actually make them... You know, construable as meanings, even if they're a bizarre meanings. And, okay. You know, and and so from that first one on, you were kind of like from from two to to wherever you are now to ninety seven. You were like, okay, well now I'm going to have more of a structure to them. Well, yeah, I mean they always have they always have the structure. What they, I mean, I may be overstating it. I think the first one's probably in some ways as construable as the others. I just, I, I think it was just finding my stride. Like yeah. the next few, I was like, oh. I, I don't have to reach for these like half rhymes or, you know, I can make that the most determined kind of fluid part of it, right? And just then make make the absurdity stand out in even more, you know, uh, pleasing relief. I, and I mean, you said like they got better as you did, and I was sort of interested in this from from your early flarf stuff to the to the front too. I mean, like it does seem that there's. I don't know. For my, for, in my taste, I, I think it's better. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, like, what? How do you think of it that way? I mean, is it just from? Is it from the practice? Is it? From I think. It, I think really, it's that simple. I think after the first one or two, yeah, I just got had a, more practice working with the pentameter and right. creating a a, a a a smoother flow. I right. Mean, really, that's that's all. And so now that you're almost at number one hundred, I mean, like, what? What do you? I mean, like. Do you have a different way of going about it? Do you have a different... No, the basic processes stay exactly the same. I, okay. I think I changed the generator at one point in the process because I found a better one. What were the... Gen what, what was the first generator? I don't first? remember what the first one was. It was kind of like a standard, what was like a, the one most people would come to first, I believe. Okay. And the way I chose it in the first place was just one that would accommodate an entire line because mm. not all of them would. Okay. Uh, usually they're, they're better at just like names or things like that. Yeah. But I found one that would take an entire, you know, line of iambic pentameter. And then, most recently, um, the one I use now is, the, I think, the best of all the ones I've used. It's called One Across at oneacross.com. Okay. And it's nice because it has a little control. I'm, I'm sure all the others have probably developed since I've been doing this, too, and can do a lot of the same things. But I'll put the basic line in the top box. And then I have a little, if I want to, there's an optional box where I can make sure it contains a certain word. Oh, okay. So if I find a certain word I want to make sure is in it, but I don't like the first few, because there are like sometimes hundreds of yeah. options to scroll through. So I can say, oh, make sure it contains lawnmower, you know, or whatever. So you uh, can limit it by that sense. So you yeah. search and then limit the search in some ways. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Um, 
And so do you ever, does it ever produce a perfectly iambic pentameter line that you can use? Uh, I, I haven't done that yet. I'm sure it's theoretically possible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I mean, the accidental million monkeys pentameter. writing King Lear, right? But, um, I, mean, accidental, I mean, you know about the pentametron, which is this wonderful Twitter-based uh, web, website. No, I do not know about the pentameter. It is, ex it is exactly kind of what you just said. It's a, somebody built a program that just continually scans Twitter, every, like everybody's Twitter account apparently. Oh, okay. And finds all lines of iambic pentameter. I mean, most of them, I'm sure, accidental. Yeah. And just and finds other lines of iambic pentameter that rhyme with them, and creates this ongoing poem. Oh. So I mean, just I can go to it right now. It's yeah. Like, And uh, the one thing about it is that it always starts with the old, the oldest part. I wish that it were bottom to top, so you could always see the most recent. Yeah. Um, wait a minute. Oh, here we are. You just go to the Twitter page for that. Yeah. Red cards and sweaty bodies everywhere. The largest arms erect into the air. I'm way excited for the album, though. You just a hoe. A stupid, stupid hoe. <laughs> Tim Duncan is a fucking dinosaur. I'm not a people person anymore. I want to wear a maxi dress today. I really want to sleep today away. And so on. Yeah. Uh, then he tells who the original tweeter was, and just random people. And so it's like the greatest poem of the 21st century. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you know who's behind it? Oh, I don't know. Uh, whoever it is, I don't know them personally, and I don't remember what their name is. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, I know that the New York Times has that one where they'll pull the haikus from, and like make little haikus too. Mm -hmm. Similar project, not as not as good. Um, uh, so getting back to to kind, of, I mean, do other people play any roles in all these things? I mean, I, I mean, well, I know, I, I guess I'm I'm interested in one like how it was writing to the listserv in the oh, early yeah. stages. I mean, like, so in terms of revision and kind of like forces that, that that sort of morphed into your poetry I mean like what was that like I that guess? was great I mean that was really I think most members of the of the list would agree that was the most stimulating yeah you know thing about being on the list was just feeding off everyone else's excitement and creativity yeah because it was a very much a big hug fest right there was not almost nothing critical going on in there ever we just tried to like write stuff that would bust each other up uh -huh. and, and it would be very responsive if somebody wrote a you know, a poem with farting unicorns, somebody else would write one and then okay. expand that, like farting glitter unicorns, you know. And, uh, and the sillier, the better. Uh, the more obnoxious, the better. And so yeah. that was the, that was the sort of privileged stuff on, on the, the farting unicorns. I mean, that sort of, like, silliness was, was very highly valued on the listserv. Yeah, I mean, that was it, that, that, that was kind of the original spirit of Florf, which is yeah. just... To, and I think it's also a part of the reason a lot of the uh, for a lot of the resistance to flare from experimental uh, directions. Yeah, there was a sense in which it wasn't taking the struggle seriously enough, or something. Mm -hmm. Which you know, I think comes out of this for me misguided sense that you know, absolute stone facedness is necessary at all times. Yeah. Uh, and there are times when I think there are legitimate objections, and I'd rather not go into the details, but there are. Um, you know, some poems that upset people. Right. And I think it was very upsetting to the people who wrote them that they did upset people because, you know, even though it might seem from the outside, well, weren't you trying to offend people? Weren't you trying to get people upset? I was like, well, no, not, you know, not these people. <laughs> right, know? right, yeah. Uh, and, and, but, and I think initially we were very resentful about it. It felt like, oh, you're, you're, you know, we're on your side and you're misunderstanding us and, you know, these are not whatever racist or sexist or uh, otherwise, you know, vile in, you know intentions that you're looking at here. But I mean, I feel like uh, as a as it's gone, as time has gone on, I mean, I, I I try I I try very hard to be more sympathetic to that response because out of that context, yeah, you know, that, that it emerged from, it's easy to see how a poem. That mentions certain things in certain tones. Right. Is it almost impossible to separate from you know, a poem that mentions those things in that tone with a, with different intentions? Yeah. Uh, and I think so, uh, even past Flarf, I mean, I think things like that are going on right now with 
some of the younger conceptual writers. And, um, yeah. You know, one's his work I really admire, and then I see other poets I really admire uh, deeply hurt you know, by the mm. work they're creating. It's very difficult. I don't have uh, a way to kind of like justify any of it or put it into order in my mind. No, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a tough one. Um, would that, uh, I mean, so, so what is, what do you think, how do you think, I mean, I mean, a lot of your career, a lot of your writing has like kind of happened on, from the internet and on the internet with the blogging and the, and the commenting and, and that, and that seems to have in some ways died down pretty in, yeah, in the way. blogging seems to be a thing of the past for, for yeah. me anyway. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, like, what? How did that shape your sort of your practice, your writing? I mean, you, you say that you've 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 evolved in some in some ways about your opinions on some of the mm -hmm. some of the content that would be included. Um, has there been any other effects, or could you elaborate more on that? Yeah. I mean, I'd say what I've evolved. First of all, what I've evolved in is not necessarily. I haven't changed my mind about you know some of the. I don't know, whatever you want to call it, starting theory. I've, I've just become, I, I've tried to become more empathetic mm -hmm. you know, and not immediately judge anyone who doesn't get it. Right. You know, or without, or even, see, even a, using a phrase like doesn't get it already shows a little residual of judgment. I'm, yeah. yeah that, that, that there may be more than one way to get it and that some ways don't match our intentions and that we need, you know, need to consider that we are accountable for that. Right. So. Well, and so much of, of sort of the, I don't know, the, the latter part of Flarf has been the sort of death of Flarf and the, and mm -hmm. the kind of the, some of the blog posts and, and whatnot. I mean, like, was that partly the reaction? Like, just let it go? I mean, like, and so it, it was, I mean, where where does it go from there, I guess, is the question. Yeah, I'm not sure how much. I think death of Flarf most of the time was a phrase we used ourselves just kind of like, you know, yeah. <laughs> tried to kill the beast you know, <laughs> before right. it killed us or something. But, um I think we did just ran its course. I think, like any movement, right? You know, it, the movement itself had it, its main value was in you know, the way it motivated the members of the movement, and most of the writers you know, have gone on to write however they're going to write. Yeah, and it's influenced by that, but it's not the same. Right. So, I mean, your original question, I guess, was about the blogging. Uh, yeah. But, um, kind of how that influenced your your own writing. I don't know. I think for me, again, the main value of the blogging thing was bringing me into contact with other with other poets, yeah. uh, having discussions. I think there were a lot of people in the early aughts, especially, blogging every day, and we were having fun conversations. And for whatever reason, people moved on to other platforms and yeah, <laughs> you know, other projects, and it just it, it also ran its course. But in terms, I don't know. I mean, I think the main effect was just just social. Okay. Um. And then, I mean, like, so, I guess one question is, could you have written the sonograms in the way that you're doing without Flarf? I mean, like, what sort of influence mm. from there? Well, I mean, there are, there are certain surface similarities, right? I mean, the, the idea of the refrigerator magnet process. I mean, yeah. pasting something into Word and using that as my template. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think Flarf, I mean, I, in some ways, at least originally, I considered it an extension of Flarf practice. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, don't know, I guess there's no way to say it is or isn't. So there's no <laughs> definite meaning to that. It is if I say it is, I guess. Right. right. But yeah. I mean, I think it definitely. Uh, it's probably something I wouldn't have done in quite the same way I did it if I hadn't been doing Flarf. What? What? I mean, and this goes back to some of the questions we were just talking about. What sort of skills did you learn in doing the Flarf that kind mm -hmm. of go into the sonograms? I mean, what did you come in like feeling strong about, and then what did you learn mm -hmm. with, without? I think it's what I mentioned earlier, just the, the approach to arrangement. Okay. Right? Finding clusters, finding strings. Yeah. Uh, in already existing groups of you know verbal verbal groups. Mm -hmm. That kind of being able to sift and sculpt something yeah. that was already in front of me. Yeah. Um, and then so I mean I think we've kind of covered some of the the general push through composition and revision, but mm -hmm. I'm also interested in how. You would put together the books, of, especially. Well, one question before I move on to that: Do you mm -hmm. still write in that sort of tr traditional flarf way? I mean, are you still grabbing Google responses? And I haven't done it in a long time. I think okay. I did a few kind of like post flarf flarf poems. <laughs> um, okay. So oh, for a couple of years after I started doing the sonograms, but eventually it just. I don't know. I think I think even the way it's like configured on the internet now is such that it's, it, it doesn't work quite in the same way. I couldn't yeah. tell exactly how, but I mean, the one or two times in the last year or two, I've even thought about trying to go back and do it. Uh, 
this isn't the same. There's a lot more information like underneath and on the side, and I mean it's just kind of been taken yeah, over. In some yeah, way. I think part of it is Google has gotten too smart. Yeah. You know, things are grouped according to usefulness rather than just random occurrence of, of words. And who you are too, which is, mm -hmm. yeah. So that, It knows me too well and it's, I don't trust it. Google <laughs> let it appear and let it disappear. It's <laughs> sort of terrifying. Um, so I mean, but in, in in those terms, like what were you using, like how were you composing the books then? I guess mm -hmm. is the question, like Deerhead Nation and, and and Breathalyzer in the front. I mean, like were, were you, do you have sec? I mean, you don't have really sections in those books. They're kind of they just kind of go through, right? Really, the only one that's thematically, in any sense, organized is the first one. Okay. I mean, with the whole deer head theme. Which yeah. Was, like I said, it's just sort of a floating metaphor. Right. Um, for the next, I mean, Breathalyzer in the front and Honest, all honesty are pretty much interchangeable in terms of how the poems are chosen and grouped. They're they're just individual poems. Uh huh. Um, and I actually have a full other manuscript that I've been that may or may not get published from that period. Okay. And it's just been so long now that even though I actually like a lot of the poems in it, I thought, does anybody really want this now? Is it is the time passed? Yeah. Um, it's called Monsters and tentatively it might come out from Edge Books, but I haven't followed up on my obligations of getting the manuscript in. <laughs> okay. So I don't know where I stand with that. I may have screwed it up. Uh, <laughs> Did you, I mean, when you were publishing these books and maybe with Monsters, do you have relationships with, with the editors that they're, mm -hmm. like, revising the shape of the book? Um, well, I definitely have a relationship with the editors. I mean, like, Rod Smith for Edge, right. like, fantastic editor, fantastic poet. Um, but he's pretty hands-off in terms of the actual creative content. Okay. I mean, maybe, in ter maybe you know, he, he's... I'd say his input and his helper's input comes at the level of things like layout. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, so I mean, I know you also have some of like 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 e chat books and and whatnot. Where yeah. where do those? I mean, what do you feel about those? And like, how do you end up with them? I haven't even looked at them in so long. I can't really yeah. give you a clear answer. It's like I remember that some of it's very early Flarf. Yeah. And yeah, and I, I, again, I haven't looked at it in a long time. I suspect like, I would probably just cringe looking at a lot of it oh. because I think it's a. Because I think what was initially exciting about the process is what quickly becomes predictable and crude about it. Uh huh. It's like, oh look, this text comes off the internet. You know, and it, it, it smells like the internet. Look at it, you can see internet all over it. Yeah. And it becomes kind of obvious after a while. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Um, what's the most recent one like that? Uh, yeah, I mean that's all so long ago that I. And in terms of like the, the 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 digital documents that contain those manuscripts and those books, I mean, are they in a certain spot in your computer somewhere? Or are they? Are, do you have them? I think I just have the original Word documents of just them. The original Word documents. Whatever else is out there, or maybe a PDF in a couple of cases. Do you feel in any way? And this is getting back to more of the technical stuff. Do you feel anywhere sort of like dear towards them? I mean, do you have like kind of, or you're just like these are there, but really the book's the book. And that's sort of a leading question, but I, I guess I'm wondering like. Like, if you, are you are you really taking care to are like is there enough value on them that you're taking they make sure you know where they are and they're valued and et cetera on the digital? Well, there's at least too. that much value that I know I have copies of them. Yeah. But beyond that, I mean, and again, it's it's not. I'm not trying to be evasive. It's not that I actually am embarrassed or have strong feelings one way or the other. It's just I really don't remember that well what's in them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, because I was just doing so much stuff at that time. Right. I mean, I'm sure if I took a few minutes to look at, oh yeah, this one, this was cool, I like this one, or oh, I don't like that one so much. But yeah, I'm trying to even form a mental image now. I mean, um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I do have a few fluff questions that I wanted to make sure I ain't asked, but I think I got. Through most of them, um, well, I mean, I guess sort of like to. Um, I mean, how does this then influence? Like, I mean, the one questions I ask these, you know, the other people who teach, and you teach too. I mean, how does this influence the way you teach? I mean, like, what sort of, mm -hmm. what did Flarf teach you that then you try to teach them, or, or anything in, in that sense? I mean, I guess the single most important thing is just. That it has to be fun on some level. Yeah. You know, not to. I think it's very. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily frame it as flarf in the classroom in this way, but I think one of the first things I try to do with a beginning classroom is break down 
a sense of over seriousness that I think yeah. sometimes holds people back. So I'll give them exercises, which people were doing long before Flarf. You know, write the worst poem you can. Yeah, things like that. Or I might, or I might, for a specific exercise, suggest a procedure that is relevant to Flarf. But I won't say, okay, now we're going to write a Flarf poem. Right. I try to. Uh, there are inevitably times when it comes up, or somebody in the class has heard of Flarf. Right. And I say, hey, what's Flarf? I don't know, the story will get told. Yeah. But I actually try to hold back on that because too often it results, I think, in uh, exercises that might be fun for the student and even produce, you know, humorous material, mm -hmm. but doesn't necessarily contribute to the kinds of foundational verbal skills, you know, that I want people to concentrate. Or if it does, it doesn't for everyone. Mm -hmm. For some people, it can be a way to avoid it. So, right. I guess that's true of everything, but... And what what are those sort of foundational verbal skills that you're after? I mean, just really basic conservative things like rhythm, uh, like uh, avoiding cliches, like... Yeah. You know, I'm just writing something that... where you're... where you're... Uh, where you're not just recycling received notions of what a poem ought to be. Right. You know. Yeah. It's all kind of getting towards writing something interesting, making something interesting to a reader, right? I mean, like in, in some way. And looking into sources you might not immediately consider, you know, encouraging them to read a lot of poetry. Yeah. The really basic things. Right, right. Um, just a few more questions. Uh, I guess. Eh, no. I think we're good. <laughs> Oh, good. Thanks, Casey. <laughs> that was really great. That was a pleasure. Yeah. Um, I'm so croaky. I'm like, <laughs> no, it'll be it'll it'll be cool on you know whatever shows up. Uh, here, let me turn these off. But.